pleasure to be here today, and uh, it's really an honor to be here uh, as requested by Daniel, who I've known for many, many years. And uh, in order to honor Daniel's thinking, I am going to be a bit more provocative than my normal kind of staid cardiac surgery way. Now, I left my tie on. My tie is kind of for investors, for patients, and for customers. You're none of the above. But for Daniel, I'm wearing the tie, but I am going to be provocative as we talk about this today. And I'd like to start out, I know this is just post-lunch, it's 3 p.m., you'd rather be sitting comfortable looking at your iPhone, smartphone, iPad, smart tablet, but I'd like you to start out by doing the following. How many of you have been personally touched by someone who has had heart disease? A loved one, a family member, you personally, a dear friend, if you have, I don't want you to raise your hand, I want you to really move here. Can you stand up? Can you literally stand up? I know it's hard, it's comfortable, those chairs are amazing, especially the bean bags are amazing. Okay, look around the room. Look how many people are standing. Okay, now, before we finish this next 14 minutes, I'm going to leave you with the promise that we can make a big difference in preventing sudden death and eliminating heart disease as the leading cause of death today. Now you can have a seat and get comfortable. I'm gonna start out by answering the clinical question that we focus on at HeartFlow. HeartFlow is the, really, and I've been doing this a long time, is the most spectacular application of science and engineering applied to medicine that I, I think exists today. And when Jim Clark donated a couple hundred million dollars to Stanford to build the BioX Center, he said, I want to bring together the best of science, engineering, computer science, and medicine, and I'm going to donate the money to build a building literally on the corner of Campus Drive with the medical school on one side and the School of Engineering and Computer Science on the other. And this is what you need to do, Stanford. You need to bring the best and the brightest from those two schools together and put them in that really great new building. That building brought together two spectacular minds, Chris Zarens, Charlie Taylor, who were the founders of HeartFlow, and over the next 15 years and a little north of $100 million of NIH and NSF money and dozens and dozens of among the most talented PhDs and postdocs you will ever see, develop the base technology to do the following things that we'll talk about. The first of which we're doing is answering a clinical question asked tens of millions of times a year by clinicians and family members alike. Does my patient or do I or my loved one have coronary artery disease, yes or no? And if so, what do I do about it? Now, you would think we would be really good at answering that question. It's the leading cause of death by far. It has massive economic impact. You reread in the headlines literally every single day, it's people who are dropping dead suddenly, who are having major morbidity and mortality. We simply have not solved this problem yet. Now, you've heard this probably 20 times in the last 20 talks, but I'm going to say it again, and I'm going to say it with a resounding emphasis. Don Berwick, unfortunately only an interim director of CMS, but boy, did he have an impact during his tenure there. Pediatrician, Harvard faculty member, ran CMS for a short period of time, coined the following triple aim of healthcare. Let's improve the health of the population, improve outcomes. Let's improve the experience of care for the patient. And boy, did we hear a great example just a few minutes ago the experience of care for the patient. Third, we need to do so while reducing the total cost of care. Now, that doesn't mean be cost effective. Mark Klatke, who's a curmudgeon cardiologist, who's the chair of health policy and research at Stanford, said, cost effectiveness is one thing, saving money is another. We need to actually reduce the cost of care. Now again, that's like motherhood and apple pie. You've heard that a million times. But I want to emphasize, if you look around in the world today in healthcare innovation, if you look at the big companies with multi-hundred billion dollar market caps that are doing healthcare delivery, you show me a product, you show me a service that hits all three of the triple aim. Not cost effective. I mean reduce the cost of care without sacrificing outcomes but improving them and while improving the experience of care for the patient. I would suggest that the technology is here and will explode in the coming decade to really make a difference. 
These are some of the demographics that I mentioned. Cardiovascular disease, by far the leading cause of death. We spend directly on coronary disease alone, a little over $180 billion today, rapidly expanding. This is a big problem. I don't need to emphasize the size of the problem. This is maybe, and I was a former, you know, I practiced cardiac surgery at Stanford. I had no idea this problem existed because I saw the patients after, you know, three doctor stops and the last stop is, no, who wants to see the cardiac surgeon, right? Nobody. The, the last stop, I didn't know this problem existed. This is the following problem. In this country alone, we spend about $10 billion with non-invasive tests trying to answer those two clinical questions that I described. Does my patient have heart disease? If so, what do I do about it? Worldwide, it's probably $20, $25 billion. And you know how good we are at answering that question? Not very good. I'm going to show you in two slides how bad we are. The current tests are the ones that are described here. A stress echo, that's what I had when I turned 40. I have a profoundly significant family history of heart disease. A good friend of mine, cardiologist, puts me on the treadmill and tortures me just because I'm a, cardi a cardiac surgeon. He wants to cause, inflict excess pain, gets my heart rate to 200 looks, tries to see if there's a wall motion abnormality. I'm a cardiac surgeon, I know a lot about echo. It's fuzzy images to me. You know, I didn't see anything that was clear, very subjective. Other tests include nuclear medicine tests. Often, they say, okay, let's send you for an invasive angiogram. Let's take a picture, put a catheter in your heart, inject some dye, take some x-rays. We'll take a picture. The anatomy will tell us the answer. Guess what? Doesn't answer the question. You can be perfect at understanding how, you know, is it 50%, is it 60, is it 20? Doesn't answer the question. For you, you need to know, is there a blockage, A, and B, does it matter for you? So the only way to test the gold standard test is actually a specialized pressure wire goes in the heart, you give a drug that simulates exercise, measure two pressures simultaneously, and you measure every single place there's a blockage. It is the gold standard. It is by far the best way to do it, but it is hard to do, it's expensive. There's a profound economic disincentive for interventional cardiologists to do it. it happens less than 10% of the time. For every one of those gold standard tests, there are 100 non-invasive tests trying to answer this question. Well, how well are we doing answering the question? Large study in 400,000 Americans, the one on the left, New England Journal of Medicine article, authored by Manesh Patel out of Duke, said that if you had a positive stress test and your doc says, okay, we better go to the angiographic suite and treat you. Maybe you're gonna need surgery, maybe you're gonna need a stent. 41% of the time, they actually had a problem. 59% false positive rate. That's pretty scary. Okay, let me tell you the flip side. 28% of the time, you had a negative test in this 400,000 patients. And the clinician said, God, my gut is telling me I better, I just don't feel comfortable. I know I have a normal test. I know it says you're okay. I'm going to send you anyway. 28% of the time, you have a significant problem needing an intervention. What I don't know is the denominator. How many of the patients where the doctor said, guess what, you have the coronaries of a 20-year-old? Anybody heard that? If they do, just double check to see what they're smoking when they give you that answer. It is not the right answer. I can tell you every single day, and I'll give you two famous examples of people who had negative stress tests every year. One is President Bill Clinton. In office, high risk, loved McDonald's, didn't exercise a lot, had a high cholesterol level, kind of a stressful job. Negative stress test year after year after year, leaves office, has a major cardiac event, ends up with, you know, heaven forbid, in the hands of a cardiac surgeon, and had a very tumultuous year recovery. Remember Tim Russert, who used to host Meet the Press? Tim Russert had a negative stress test six years in a row. Sudden death. We're not solving this problem. In women, 55% of women, the first presenting symptom is sudden death. It's not a symptom, it's not chest pain, it's death. In men, it's 40%. We have got to solve this problem. What, what the technology that the team at HeartFlow has developed, and I'm not gonna talk a lot about the technology or the company, but the vision. It takes data from a CT scan, standard cardiac CT, and a standard cardiac CT with today's state-of-the-art technology has the radiation dose that approximates that of a screening mammogram. It's striking. 10 years ago, it was 40 times that dose. Striking technology. You take it during a breath hold, hold your breath, get the image, you're done. That data is then uploaded in a secure, anonymized, encrypted way over the internet to us, and in our high-performance computing environment can give back the answer to the clinician that they have been seeking which is A, does my patient have coronary artery disease, and B, what do I do about it? And I mean, what do I do about it precisely? 
Not do they need to go to the cath lab, but do they need a stent? If so, where, how? If they need bypass surgery, how do we optimize that? And how are we going to optimize medical therapy? All as a web service. Now, that technology is built on 50 years of computational fluid dynamics history, but most recently, and frankly, even when we got the company started five and a half years ago, I didn't envision what would happen. Is as a web service, we obviously get the data. Using the data and sophisticated machine learning, now deep learning tools, we get smarter and faster and better with everything we do, every patient we see, every outcome we monitor. It is uh, literally week to week, the progress is astonishing. This concept is using big data, machine learning, we can answer the clinical questions that matter today. This is a snapshot. You're going to become an expert at reading the heart flow study. If it's red, it's bad. If it's to the left of 0.8, it means a greater than 20% reduction in flow. You need something done. Left anterior descending, this patient needs something done. We have a lot of data. Again, I'm not allowed to talk about the data, but today I believe in medicine, you have to lead with overwhelming clinical evidence. You have to have data so profoundly incontrovertible that the payers and the providers alike will embrace what the patients change. Data matters. Transparency matters. Get it in the peer-reviewed literature, open up your kimono, show what you've got. We are a big believer in that. Now we have about 80 peer-reviewed publications. This is our most recent trial in 600 patients prospectively studied in Europe, looking at the primary end point of patients going to the cath lab in the standard of care in 11 European leading centers, 73%, during the invasive test, had no significant disease. If you used heart flow, and you didn't mandate it by protocol, but you said, you know the data, you know how good we are, use it or not use it, what happens? 61% of the patients needed no invasive test, exact same number needed intervention. Same number of patients get treated. Fascinating, how is that the same number? But this is what's most fascinating, is the patients treated with the heart flow approach, which is simply a diagnostic and therapeutic strategy, had a dramatically improved quality of life. They had less angina, they had less chest pain, they had an improved quality of life. The right patient getting the right therapy the right way, all enabled through a web service. This is a really important piece. This is a, a publication just published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology less than a month ago, Mark Klatke, the lead author. A reduction in the total cost of care by up to 32%. He tried to figure out Medicare doesn't pay for heart flow today, so I said, even if it were charged $2,100, which is not what we would charge, that's too much money, it would still save the system a net of 20%. And now let me tell you what that means to payers. So the average commercial payer in the United States, per 10 million covered lives, at least 560 people would avoid death and heart attack, conservative number, 70,000 would avoid a invasive procedure, and the reduce, reduction in the cost of care is north of a half a billion dollars per 10 million covered lives. Net free cash flow enhancement. Now that's putting the, the payer in some control. Now let me show you the next part, and this is where I'm gonna be a little provocative, but this is not yet FDA approved, maybe within the next year, we expect it to be. Here's a color-coded three-dimensional map of a patient. You can see, again, red is bad, green is intermediate, blue is good, and you can see this patient, actually, this is an iPad demo, but I didn't want to hot plug an iPad back and forth. You're going to interrogate, if the number's less than 0.8, it needs an intervention. And post-stenting, if it's above 0.9, your progression is almost as good as a patient without heart disease. So post-stenting, you want to know that you're going to have a result that's better than 0.9. And here we are in this patient, trying to figure out with two complex lesions what it's going to do. This is the right coronary artery, supplies about 40% of the heart. If you put a stent in one place, you're going to see that in just a second. You're going to see at the top, it's over in the stent mode. It's going to click over here. We're going to calculate real time what that stent will do. And in a recent publication we just published in Jack Intervention, with 96% precision, can tell you what the result of the therapy will be before you even end up in the interventional suite. Precision medicine. Providing the right therapy to the right patient the right way. This is a heat map looking at the obstructions in the coronary artery, the constituency of those obstructions, and the forces on those plaques. 
You put those things together, you have the ability in a simple diagnostic test to predict which patients will have an event. Being a surgeon, this is clearly true to my heart, bypass graft, again, the prediction of exactly what the outcome will be before you even go to the operating suite. Now, where will we be? This is my last slide, I'll be quick. I believe in five years we'll eliminate the invasive lab as a place to test, but only a place to treat. When I trained as a general surgeon, we used to do exploratory laparotomies. What a crazy idea in 2015. Let's go to the cath lab when we need to do a treatment. The physician would not dream of doing a therapy without knowing what the outcome will be before. We will substitute population-based get guesswork for precision patient-specific diagnosis and treatment. In 10 years, I believe we will eliminate sudden coronary death in the vast majority of patients because we will know exactly who's at risk, how they're at risk, and how to intervene with medicine, lifestyle, interventional therapy when needed, surgery when heaven forbid is needed, but change the course of the natural progression of the disease. Everything I've just described not only applies to the heart, but applies to the carotids and the brain and the periphery. In fact, those were developed at Stanford ahead of the heart technology. This is the time for exponential medicine. Thank you for having me here today. It's really a pleasure. Thank you, John. So everyone's going to ask, when can, you mentioned coming soon, FDA cleared. When is somebody going to be able to get a prescription from their primary care doctor to have this done? Depends on what, where you live. Mm -hmm. So we are in a, you know, refining the technology is a little different than refining a perfect end-to-end -end product. So if you're in California, there's a very large system about to start in the next two weeks. If you're in Michigan, you can go now. If you're in New York, you can go now. If you're in Minnesota, you can go now. If they're in Texas, you can go now. Kind of depends. We're being very selective and rolling And how are our friends, the interventional cardiologists, who make their bread and butter on doing diagnostic casts, feeling about this? So, you know, the, the good news is most interventional cardiologists want to do the right thing for their patients. The reality is when you take this much money out of the system, there is going to be opposition. And so our philosophy in pricing is that we want to keep about 75% of the economic savings in the system so that the payer and the provider can share in those economics in a way where there's incentives, not just threats. But, you know, disruption is hard. That's why the data has to be so overwhelming. They can't say no. Great. Thanks a lot. Great. Cheers. Thank you.